My lovely granddaughter, Sophia, was set to get married. She had chosen a partner who was none other than a self-made company president. Overflowing with joy at the prospect of seeing Sophia in a wedding dress, I made my way to the venue. However, an unexpected event awaited me there. My son, Kyle, and his wife, Rachel, confronted me with unexpectedly harsh words. Kyle, in a very stern tone, said to me, Being poorly educated is a disgrace. Leave this instant. Rachel stood by his side, with a disdainful attitude, adding, You don't belong here. If you care about Sophia, please, just go home. I was taken aback by their sudden words, and was momentarily speechless. Looking at them I realized they both stood firmly behind what Rachel was saying. In the upper echelons of society, like company presidents and their associates, a mother like me, who makes a living farming, was considered out of place. They strongly preferred not to publicly acknowledge me as a relative, and their feelings were clearly transmitted. To them, someone like me, engaged in agriculture in the countryside, was nothing more than an embarrassment. My hands trembled, my mind was in turmoil, and my head felt blank, unsure of how to react. As I stood there, paralyzed by shock, my son and his wife, reveling in a sense of superiority, attempted to forcibly remove me from the venue. However, their actions were too conspicuous, causing people near the entrance to start murmuring, and this unrest soon spread throughout the venue. I feared ruining Sophia's precious wedding and was determined to avoid that at all costs, despite the heaviness in my heart. With a heavy heart, but resolutely, I quietly agreed. Understood. I replied quietly, yet firmly. My voice was frail and small, but it seemed to be captured by the people in the venue. For a moment, the surroundings fell silent, and a hush spread. Then, as if breaking the silence, the sound of chairs scraping against the floor began to echo. My name is Linda Morris. I live in a typical countryside area, rich in nature and a bit away from urban regions. This year, I'm turning 60 and make a living as a full-time farmer by myself. Every day, I till the farmland and live off the sales of corn and vegetables I grow there. Originally, the farming done by my late husband's family became the center of my life. When I married into the Morris family decades ago, I took over the agricultural work of my husband's family home. In my family, there wasn't a specific job passed down through generations. So, at first, I was unfamiliar with the knack for farming and experienced many hardships. Even something as simple as watering has its profound complexities. My husband and in-laws always treated me warmly and taught me how to manage the farmland. The cycle of work changes throughout the year, planting in spring, harvesting vegetables in summer, grain harvesting in autumn, and preparing for the next spring in winter. The daily minutiae of changes are hard to notice, but at harvest time, the accumulated efforts take shape visibly. I've come to deeply understand the allure of farming and the fulfillment it brings. Back then, I believed the happy days spent with my husband and in-laws would last forever. However, not long after Kyle was born, my husband fell seriously ill. I vividly remember how exhausted my in-laws and I were, juggling the care of a newborn, managing the fields, and the devoted nursing of my husband. As a result, on a lonely day with the winter snow piled high, my husband, unfortunately, passed away. The sorrow of that time was profound, and everyday life was unbearably painful. Unable to consider marrying again, I was immersed in deep grief over the loss of my husband, but my in-laws and the people in the community earnestly comforted and supported me. Watching little Kyle grow a bit each day, becoming stronger and more robust, frequently brought me solace. Overcoming these hardships, I joined hands with my in-laws, vowing to continue farming while raising Kyle to be a responsible individual. 
Being a single parent, I couldn't afford to be a burden on my son. I wanted Kyle to study hard and support him in achieving the future he desires. My in-laws fully supported this decision, sparing no effort in providing all the necessary assistance for his education and future. Whenever Kyle wanted to attend tutoring, we supported him, and in middle and high school, we encouraged him to focus more on extracurricular activities than on helping out at home. Amidst these conditions, Kyle expressed his desire to go to college. Everyone is going to college. I feel like I'll be left behind if I don't go too. I answered with understanding. Yes, these are the times we live in. Having graduated from high school young and married early, I wasn't very familiar with college life. However, I often heard from people around me that graduating from college is common these days. Knowing how much my son wanted this, I decided from the bottom of my heart to support him. I said gently, yet with determination. All right, go ahead. Don't worry about the money. We'll figure something out. Although there were financial challenges, thinking of my son's future, I decided to support his education and managed to arrange the necessary funds. As a result, even without my husband, I was able to send Kyle off to college successfully. Kyle went to the city, undoubtedly gaining various experiences at university. After graduating, he easily decided to become a company employee and informed me of his intention. Kyle stated firmly, I'll find a job in the city. It seemed he had no intention of taking over the farm. I have continued farming on my own, following in the footsteps of my parents-in-law, who are no longer with us, and it is not that I did not wish for Kyle to take over the farm. But perhaps that's an outdated idea now. I've come to think that it's best for Kyle to follow his own path. I won't oppose you. Choose your own path. While keeping my feelings hidden, I decided to fully support my son's decision. Years later, Kyle suddenly told me he was getting married. His chosen partner was a woman named Rachel, whom he met at his company. This news came completely out of the blue, as Kyle often didn't reply much to my messages, and no one told me he was seeing someone. However, surprised as I was, I wholeheartedly blessed my son's marriage. I remember when Rachel came to our house to greet us before their marriage, it was just after sowing corn, and it was becoming a busy time for farming. Contrary to my expectations for the woman marrying my son, as soon as she entered our house, she glanced over our living room and my appearance, and with a sneer in her voice, she said, People from farming families usually have a lower education, don't they? That's why you live in a house like this, right? I had made sure our house was clean and I was properly dressed to welcome a guest. But compared to the urban apartments where Rachel lived, our single-story house must have seemed modest. Perhaps our farming lifestyle was hard for her to understand, as she was raised in the city, and both her parents are company employees who graduated from a university. Yes, that's right. I'm sorry we don't have a nicer house. I involuntarily looked at Kyle standing beside me, but, unfortunately, he was looking at me with the same disdainful gaze as Rachel. Kyle then said, raising his voice. Exactly. It's really embarrassing to have a home like this. Growing up in this house, Kyle, as a farmer's son, was often teased about it when he was a child. When he came home from school, I always comforted him. You've done nothing wrong. But those words might not have fully reached him. Since he was young, he kept saying, I hate being a farmer's child. I taught him that no profession should be looked down upon, but Kyle wouldn't listen and gradually began to disdain my job. Seeing him sneer at Rachel's words hurt me deeply. More than Rachel's words, I felt sorry towards my parents who raised me and towards my late husband for raising a son like this. Yet, 
I've accepted that times have changed and decided to hope for their happiness in the future and support them. Later on, my son and Rachel started a new life in an urban apartment and hardly ever returned to our countryside home. In fact, we barely communicated. Still, hoping to be of some support as they live their urban life, I regularly send them vegetables. I hope those boxes of vegetables somehow help them. It's sad not to get a word of thanks, but my purpose in sending them isn't to be thanked. I don't want to impose as a mother-in-law or interfere more than necessary. I just wanted to convey the same kindness my in-laws showed me, to my son and his wife. For a while, I plan to quietly support them without minding the distance between us. Years passed, and my son and his wife had two daughters. It's been about 20 years, but the birth of my first granddaughter, Sophia, was a great joy for me. Living in the countryside, I wasn't very favored by Rachel, my daughter-in-law who lived in the city, and my opportunities to see my granddaughter were limited. The first time I met Sophia was quite a while after she was born. Even after that, I could only see her a few times a year, but Sophia grew very fond of me. Sophia was a kind-hearted and gentle child. She would light up at the sight of the vegetables I sent, and on behalf of her parents, she would express her gratitude. I love grandma's vegetables. They're always delicious. As she grew older, she started visiting the countryside more often in place of her parents. She was eager to help with farming, showing an honest eagerness to learn and apply what I taught her. As I got older and the work became more challenging, Sophia's help was truly appreciated. However, it seemed that Kyle did not approve of Sophia's activities in the countryside. I heard he would scold her in a displeased manner every time she returned. It appears Kyle would say in a stern voice. Farming is for people with low education. You should quit it. Sophia was puzzled but replied. Um, but... It seemed she was deeply hurt by these words, but her kind heart couldn't muster a rebuttal. When she next visited my home, she explained the situation while repeatedly apologizing. I too was deeply hurt by my son's words, unable to counter them. Indeed, I have a low education level, and I can't change the reality that my son dislikes farming. Accepting this reality, I go about my days. On a cool autumn day, as Sophia had grown into an adult, Kyle and Rachel returned to our countryside home after many years. I was genuinely surprised by this rare event of my son and his wife visiting this old house, but as a mother, I warmly welcomed their return. Kyle and Rachel appeared somewhat uncomfortable in this house filled with nostalgia. They carefully observed the house and, while dusting off the living room sofa, sat down with a bit of heaviness. They showed little interest in the tea I prepared with all my heart, seemingly frowning upon it. Despite my daily efforts to clean the house and choosing high-quality tea, it seemed they simply did not like it because it was a countryside home. Sitting next to such parents, Sophia looked as though she wanted to say something, yet appeared apologetic. To ease the atmosphere, I gently asked them the purpose of their visit. Sophia seemed to be searching for words, visibly nervous and struggling to start speaking. Um. Grandma. Meanwhile, Kyle and Rachel sat in silence, a quiet tension hanging in the air. When I encouraged her to speak again, Sophia finally opened up. Actually. Grandma, I'm getting married. The news of my granddaughter's marriage was a very happy event for me. It's wonderful that Sophia has found someone to share her life with. Moreover, I was filled with gratitude that she made such an important report to me, despite the fact that we hadn't had many chances to meet. I offered my heartfelt congratulations. Sophia, congratulations. It's such wonderful news. After a while of silence, Rachel leaned forward and suddenly started talking enthusiastically. Listen, about Sophia's fiancé. 
Sophia's fiancé turned out to be a business owner, currently one of the most well-known figures in the industry. This marriage has led to Kyle's company striking a deal with him, rapidly elevating Kyle's status within the company, with a promotion also imminent. Rachel proudly spoke of her efforts in making Sophia study from morning till night, taking various classes, and attending a good university as having paid off. She boastfully declared her belief that education enriches one's life. Next to her, Sophia seemed somewhat uncomfortable talking about her own marriage, appealing to me with her eyes, looking apologetic. I felt that Sophia's modest and kind demeanor must have captured her partner's heart. I gave Sophia a look, signaling that everything would be alright. Afterward, Rachel continued to talk incessantly, spending dozens of minutes. Once Rachel's series of stories concluded, Sophia finally began to speak, getting to her original purpose. The main reason for her visit this time was to invite me to her upcoming wedding. While I smiled warmly at Sophia's excited demeanor, I was curious about Kyle and Rachel's reactions and watched their expressions. After Sophia asked me to attend her wedding, they frowned and began to express various opinions to Sophia. Sophia, you shouldn't make such unreasonable requests to your grandmother. Rachel emphasized how difficult my daily life was, speaking fervently about it. Although she spoke in a familiar tone, she had never once seen my day-to-day -day life. That's right, even traveling from the countryside to the city is tough. Kyle began to explain how difficult it would be to travel from our home to the wedding venue, based on his own experiences. Plus, you have to get new clothes for the wedding. Don't make her do something difficult. His words implied the assumption that I didn't own formal attire. Their words superficially contained concern for my health and situation, but actually, it was clear they did not want me to attend the wedding. Because Sophia's fiancé is a business owner, the wedding is expected to be lavish, with many notable people attending. My everyday life, spent in work clothes covered in mud from the rice fields, is the exact opposite of the sophisticated urban atmosphere. They are probably concerned that having a grandmother who lives such a rural life might disrupt their daughter's special day. However, it seemed Sophia visited to tell me about her marriage out of her own strong desire. Although her parents were still hesitant, Sophia persisted in persuading them and asked for my attendance at the wedding. Sophia looked nervous, but gathered her courage to ask. Grandma, will you come to the ceremony? While I was concerned about Kyle and Rachel's expressions, I couldn't miss my granddaughter's important moment. Of course, I'd be delighted to attend. I answered with a smile. Sophia showed such joy at my response. I'll make sure it's an absolutely wonderful wedding. She promised and then left my home. Despite some worries, I felt a sincere joy as I saw them off. On the day of the wedding, with the refreshing breeze of spring, I went to the venue alone. It seemed Kyle and Rachel were not interested in going together with me. They had previously expressed concern about me, but in reality, there had been no discussion about accompanying me to the wedding or consulting about what to wear. Especially since attire that matched the status of both families was expected at the wedding, I should have been mindful about choosing my outfit, yet I received no guidance. Eventually, I researched the venue's location myself and got there by using public transport and taxis. Fortunately, the venue was a well-known location in the area, so the taxi driver had no issues arriving on time. As for my attire, I wore a formal beige dress that I had at home. Even though we are farmers, our family has a long heritage, and we own many quality clothes, so I believed my outfit was appropriate. Kyle and Rachel, seeing me seated in the family area, looked displeased as if they hadn't wanted me to come. Their eyes seemed to convey, I wish she hadn't come, or, we can't complain about her outfit. Kyle spoke in an apologetic tone. It must have been tough for you today, mom. I responded with a smile. 
It's okay, it's a special day for my precious granddaughter. So, would you join us for the greetings? After that, Kyle and Rachel, as if nothing had happened, made a polite greeting to me and encouraged me to accompany them for the greeting rounds to the other guests. As Sophia's grandmother, I think I was able to greet everyone without embarrassment. However, I was left wondering if my son and his wife had forgiven me. And then, the long-awaited ceremony began, and the groom, Eric, whom I saw for the first time, was a fine young man who stood straight and wore his tuxedo splendidly. His demeanor of gently supporting a slightly nervous Sophia conveyed his sincere and warm character. Regretting not being able to greet Kyle and Rachel beforehand, I worried if being seen as an insincere grandmother would adversely affect Sophia. However, the warm smiles from the newlyweds made me feel that my concerns were unnecessary. Sophia seemed to have found a wonderful partner. Moreover, the ceremony itself was incredibly beautiful, the chapel was decorated with colorful flowers, and Sophia, in her pure white dress, being blessed by family and friends, was truly magnificent. I was moved to tears many times. And with the ceremony successfully concluding, only the reception remained. Before heading to the reception, I decided to stop by the restroom to freshen up. On my way to the reception venue, I approached Kyle and Rachel. I'm going to stop by the restroom. We still have plenty of time, right? Yeah, there's still plenty of time, so take your time. Reassured by his response, I headed to the restroom. Because of me having to fix my updo, it all took a bit of time, and I was slightly delayed, but I arrived at the reception venue on time for the start. Surprisingly, music was already playing at the venue, and the staff were coming and going, making it lively. Feeling something was off, I asked a nearby staff member if it was alright to enter the reception hall. Excuse me, is it okay, to enter the reception now? To my surprise, it seemed the bride and groom had already made their entrance. Perhaps I had mistaken the time. The staff, having heard that all attendees were already seated, hurriedly opened the entrance for me. Feeling deeply apologetic and not wanting to disturb anyone, I quietly made my way to my seat when the figures of two people appeared before me. It was Kyle and Rachel. Kyle frowned, crossing his arms and looking at me sternly. Then, he spoke to me with a look of dissatisfaction. Mom, what is the meaning of this? Being late to the reception? My son's cold gaze made my heart ache a little. I'm sorry, it seems I got the time wrong. I was filled with a sincere feeling of apology, but Kyle couldn't hide his irritation and lashed out at me. Can't even read the time correctly, how hopeless. Can't someone with a low education manage time? After those words, he raised his voice even more and continued. Having a low education is really embarrassing. Just go back home. Rachel, who was listening beside, added with a disdainful expression, mocking me. It's inappropriate for you to be here. For Sophia's sake, please leave. I was at a loss for words at their comments. I realized what Rachel said was true for them as a couple. Among the high social status of company presidents and their associates, me being a farmer's mother was deemed unfit by them. I could strongly feel their intention not to recognize me as a family member. My life as a farmer in the countryside was nothing but a source of embarrassment for them. My hands trembled, my mind was in turmoil, and I didn't know how to respond. In the midst of the tense atmosphere, I was deeply hurt by my son and his wife's actions, left speechless. In this strained situation, Kyle and Rachel attempted to take me out of the venue, firmly grabbing my arm. Their actions drew the attention of nearby guests, and the murmurs began to spread throughout the venue. It seemed their attempt was too loud, making the situation clear to other attendees. 
Feeling that I might ruin Sophia's wedding, I resignedly replied to them quietly. Yes, I understand. I will leave. My voice was soft, yet it seemed to reach the people in the venue. After a moment of silence, the sound of chairs being moved began to echo, and astonishingly, attendees started getting up one after another, preparing to leave. In particular, the groom's business associates and company executives seemed to be hastily leaving their seats. Confused by this sudden turn of events, Kyle and Rachel looked around, trying to grasp the situation. While I was surprised by this development, I looked towards the bride and groom. Eric and Sophia stood petrified in front of a luxurious golden screen, puzzled by the surrounding movement. Amidst this, the groom, Eric, walked towards me. From his expression, it was clear he had something important to say. Standing in front of me, Kyle, and Rachel, Eric began to speak with a serious expression. Actually, we're all high school graduates. So, we feel we don't belong here and will be leaving the venue. I couldn't hide my surprise at his words and caught my breath. Kyle and Rachel were clearly shocked as well, their eyes wide open. Then, Eric shifted his gaze to me and began to speak about his life with a calm expression. His mother was in a similar situation to mine. Despite being academically excellent, she married into a farming family after high school. And like me, she lost her husband early and raised Eric on her own. She was a proud person who nurtured Eric with the crops she grew herself, instilling in him the value of being a farmer. Eric himself couldn't afford to go to college due to financial constraints, but he grew up watching his mother's back. It was a series of hardships, but with his innate effort, he achieved success in his work, earned the trust of those around him, and eventually became the president of a company. He built a business that values talented individuals, regardless of being high school graduates. As Eric finished his story, Sophia quietly appeared behind him. Her face was wet with tears, showing the struggle she faced in this difficult situation. It was understandable how she felt, seeing her parents and grandmother put in such a situation. However, with a determined expression, she raised her voice towards her parents, Kyle and Rachel. Education shouldn't matter here. Those who say such things don't belong in this place. Leave. The normally calm Sophia yelling at her parents for the first time shocked everyone present. Her tears seemed to be a mix of frustration and sadness. Her decision was clear, and her strong will was conveyed. Kyle and Rachel were astounded and visibly shaken. Their eyes were filled with confusion and shock. Rachel tried to calm Sophia, but her anger did not subside and she continued to give her parents a cold stare. In an attempt to calm Sophia, Eric gently embraced her shoulder and continued with an important statement. From now on, I think we need to reconsider our business relations with Kyle's company. After all, you'd want to avoid any association with just high school graduates, wouldn't you? At that moment, Kyle seemed to realize the gravity of the situation, showing an expression of deep anxiety. He didn't look at me or his still confused wife, Rachel, but instead, pleaded hastily with Eric. Please, overlook this matter. I beg you. He argued that this issue was based on personal feelings and shouldn't affect his company. However, neither Eric nor Sophia accepted his plea. In fact, the business relationship between the two companies was established starting with Sophia's marriage. Eric denied the possibility of continuing the contract, insulted by the derogation of employees with only high school diplomas. After a brief argument, Kyle and Rachel ended up leaving the venue. Afterwards, the reception resumed its peaceful course, continuing as if nothing had happened. Led by Sophia, I was able to take my seat without issue. Though I couldn't say I was entirely calm inside, I focused on wholeheartedly celebrating the newlyweds. 
Sophia, holding back tears, still managed to smile happily. Just seeing her expression warmed my heart. Her gentle smile made all the hardships of the moment worthwhile. What happened to Kyle and Rachel afterward is something I only heard through the grapevine. Apparently, they were put in a quite difficult situation. For one, the transaction with Eric's company was cancelled, which seemingly had serious repercussions for their business. I heard that Kyle, who had been valued for his good relationship with Eric, was demoted due to the incident at the reception. The event likely spread throughout his company, possibly exacerbating his standing. Furthermore, the presence of company associates at the reception means the impact could be immeasurable. I decided that my relationship with Kyle and Rachel was beyond repair and stopped sending them crops as I used to. This might have been a significant blow to their household finances. The crops I provided were surprisingly expensive, sometimes becoming unaffordable depending on the season. In their household, they likely saved on the cost of these groceries I supplied and allocated it to other living expenses. Now, without my support, they probably find it challenging to maintain their previous standard of living. I heard that Rachel, who had been a full-time housewife after their marriage, started a part-time job to support their living. It seemed like a tough transition for her, returning to work after such a long break. I continue my agricultural life in the countryside, unchanged. Daily, I diligently watch over the fields and enjoy the quiet dialogue with the plants. My routine maintains its tranquility, but as I age, even minor farm work has become physically demanding. The neighbors are increasingly concerned about my health. However, I'm not working alone anymore. Especially on weekends, Sophia and Eric come from the city specifically to help. Despite their busy weekdays, they find time to visit this distant countryside. Even when I tell them, don't overdo it, they answer with a smile, saying they come of their own will. I really like farming. Eric, in particular, shows efficiency reminiscent of someone raised on a farm. When I teach him a little about the land, he quickly understands and engages eagerly. He talks about remembering the times he farmed with his mother. Watching him, it's clear how discerning Sophia was in choosing him. Sophia herself is endearing as she works hard alongside Eric. Spending time with my grandchildren brings me immeasurable happiness. The days spent with them in this quiet countryside are irreplaceable to me. Sophia once said to me while looking over the fields. Grandma, the corn this year has a particularly beautiful color, doesn't it? I responded with a smile to her remark. Yes, it really is beautiful. The harvest season is drawing near. The corn we three planted was about to be harvested soon. This year's harvest is especially abundant compared to the past, and watching the growth of all the crops and vegetables has been a joy. Seeing the corn shimmer in a beautiful hue gives me a feeling that this year's yield will be incomparably better than before. This year's harvest seems to hold a special significance for us. The joint effort with Sophia and Eric seems to have breathed new life into these fields. Their help is why we can look forward to such a wonderful harvest.